Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Dean and I'm doing my PhD at the University of Reading with Brian Pickles and Tom Oliver. And I'm going to talk today uh, about my work on a project that the Sussex Wildlife Trust have been doing for the last couple of decades now, which is looking at the success and growth of black poplar. Now you can see here some rather lovely images that I took on my fieldwork and don't worry there are plenty more. So there are three particular aims that I want to discuss today very quickly. The first is the importance of mycorrhizae, something that a lot of people generally don't need to consider or think about very often. Second, a brief intro of what I've been doing in Sussex and thirdly, what I hope to be able to do with it. And there's a secret fourth one, which is to convince you that mycorrhizae are the most interesting taxonomic group that we have. My PhD has three particular focuses. One is intraspecific variation. So I'm very interested in differences between genotypes and clones, but also plasticity within those as well. Secondly, the role of mycorrhizae. I'm going to end up saying that a lot today. Um, and also the role that climate change plays on this relationship. Now, I'm not trying to be obnoxious with this one, but I want to make it very clear that to a lot of people, a tree is simply that above ground part that we see on a daily basis. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the more interesting and more important aspects are buried deep in the root systems beneath it in the soil where we can't see them. And that's the issue that I want to try and help address. So mycorrhizae, for those who are not familiar, is a relationship between a mycorrhizal fungus and a host plant. Now, I believe at the moment over 80% of plants are thought to form mycorrhizae. I believe in more recent work it's starting to creep up to around 90%. So a lot of plants will form this relationship. And the reason that it's so important is that the fungal uh, organism will surround the plant roots. And by doing so, it will enable better water uptake and transport, better transfer of nutrients to the plant, as well as conferring things like chemical and disease defence. Mycorrhizae as a, an organism are quite an interesting one. So if we think very simply that a plant has some roots and a mycorrhizal fungus forms a relationship with them, we're not just thinking about a single individual, as in this case here we can have tens to hundreds of different species living on the same roots of one individual plant. They can compete with each other, they can have different specialisms, and together they form a very diverse and useful community. But the most interesting aspect is this one, which is when you have a huge number of mycorrhizal species and a huge number of different plant species and numbers of individuals, you share that mycorrhizal network. So not only do we have different mycorrhizae on different plants, but we actually have different species of tree connected to each other by their root systems. And by doing so, they're able to share resources with each other. There are two particular groups that I want to show you today. Black poplar, which I will get to, can form two different associations, which is quite uncommon. Normally, a plant will form one or the other, but black poplar has the possibility to do both. The first one I've got here is ectomycorrhizae. Ectomycorrhizae, a particularly good example here, they wrap around a, hair, a root hair cell, like a glove or a sock, and they interact with the soil and create a massive hyphal network throughout the soil, which can increase the surface area of the plant dramatically. The slightly more bizarre one is things like arbuscular mycorrhizae, which are normally a single-celled fungal organism. And these invade into a plant root and live inside it, whereas beforehand, the ectomycorrhizae will simply wrap around. So in this instance, you can see some of the cells invading into a uh, root hair and then sending out little hyphae into the soil to gather nutrients and water. So when we come back to black poplar, the things that we can use mycorrhizae for, mitigating water stress. A lot of mycorrhizae have been used, particularly in agricultural research and settings, to reduce water usage in crops. Certainly there are examples where arbuscular, the single-celled ones in sort of grasses and wheat, that kind of idea, can reduce water use by up to 50%. 
but also any plant that uses mycorrhizae will be able to use this benefit as well. The second most important one really is access to what I call inaccessible nutrients. Not only do we increase the surface area of a plant's root system phenomenally, but also the fungi themselves are able to actively digest nutrients uh, that the plant otherwise just can't access. The plant roots will simply absorb whatever is there, but the mycorrhizae can break down and store other forms of nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, magnesium, aluminium, whatever it needs to be, which gives the plant access to those small micronutrients that they otherwise can't get. We also have protection against pathogens. There's a colleague of mine who's currently working on ways to stop honey fungus, and one of those is to encourage mycorrhizal networks to associate around plant root cells. The ectos, which wrap around like a sock, physically form a barrier, stopping pathogens that spread through the soil, like a honey fungus or other bacteria and fungal diseases. And then lastly, this sort of nutrient movement is a bigger term, is sharing resources between older trees to younger trees, which then aids with establishment. So a young seedling is able to hijack the network that an older tree has already put together and access this set of nutrients that we're already interested in. And then this also allows us to have sequestration for carbon and nitrogen and other minerals. So we come to black poplar. And black poplar is one of the most endangered native trees in the UK. This is a map taken from the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. They have an awesome feature where you can type in any plant you like and they will give you a distribution. Normally, UK is entirely red when you do that with another plant, but with black poplar, you can see that it's very disparate. And particularly if we focus down where we are, there are a handful of individual trees. This is a problem. So black poplar is dioecious, which means it has male and female individuals. The problem at the moment is that, for example, in Sussex, mature reproductive age trees can be dozens of miles from the nearest individual. And if they're not male or female, then uh, that also has other issues. So when it comes to black poplar, simply having more of them is an immediate first step. So now we come to some work that the Sussex Wildlife Trust have been doing for a number of years, and is to replant as many of these as they can. So unless been updated in the last couple of years. It was on around 7,000 um, and it comes from five distinct genotypes that are found in Sussex. Um, and let's come round to Wyam and Nep. They're planted by a whole number of different landowners, including Nep. The idea being to increase the numbers of trees, to increase as many of the different rarer genotypes, such as this little clone 24, and get some more female trees out into the counties as well. So we come to my work over the summer. The first year I did this, I didn't have the right soil equipment and I couldn't get any soil. So I came back again this year and my soil equipment broke twice because the summer was so hot and the ground was just like concrete. But I did manage to get to around 20 different sites. And like was mentioned before, I've used the, the soilscape key as a guide here. So we have NEP with its green, slightly acidic, but quite clay, loamy, and reasonably well-draining soil. The blue is very similar, but is just generally wetter. And then the brown, similar again, but does not drain nearly as well. So in terms of ideal habitat for a black poplar, black poplar love wet, clay soil. So we'll be very happy in green or blue, and less in brown. And each one of these sites that I visited, I took some leaf samples so I can double check their clone number, and also measurements such as height, diameter at breast height, and soil, soil pH and soil moisture. Now, the most interesting part is the mycorrhizal colonisation, but I haven't done that yet because I haven't got round to it. I'm sorry. So this is what I have got to show you. Um, these are just some box plots that can uh, contrast the same three soil types we were looking at earlier. Remember, blue and green are the ones we expect to be a bit better, and uh, brown less so. And generally, it seems to work out. So if I make uh, mixed effect models, the most useful predictors tend to be soil pH, soil moisture, which makes a great deal of sense, and also soil type in general, but I can split those up. Um, the interesting one here I put down as tree condition. This is on a scale of 0 to 10, uh, using a variety of different measures. And that's something that struck me as particularly interesting, 
So when I come to do the mycorrhizal work, I'm sure that I can tease out some of this a bit more, and I'm loath to put too much into this until I've done so, so please forgive me. Um, but generally, brown soil tends to perform slightly less well. Um, NEP lies in here. Unfortunately, quite a lot of the ones that NEP have died, uh, you had a lot of trees. Um, so that's unexpected. But there's an interesting element that I want to hopefully explain more of later. But when it comes to tree condition, uh, for the most part, it seems to be unrelated to soil. And I'll show you why. Disease, for the most part, seems to come from rust um, and other fungal diseases on the black poplar themselves, rather than uh, the condition being reduced by poor growth or something. It's more, actually, that the leaves seem to disappear well at the beginning of summer, when they should be at their most uh, green and growing. And instead, most of them lose their uh, leaves to disease or caterpillars. This is a poplar hawk moth. In fact, my office adopted one I accidentally brought home with me. But there are definitely issues with disease that I think trump a lot of the other ones. Simply wrong poor soil, perhaps uh, an interesting one. And the soil community is the aspect that I hope to be able to explain in the next few months or so. And that is really the mycorrhizal and also the soil invertebrate work as well. And herbivory. And I include in this also being attacked by a pig or a cow, which to an extent could happen, but for the most part seems to be relatively minor. So I'll, f I'll end with where I hope to go with this. At the moment, I'm setting up a greenhouse experiment, which is to take these soils, to take black poplar cuttings, to plant them into those soils and see exactly what happens. So if mycorrhizae form on them, and that helps them to establish and grow, can I watch it happen? Can I see how they form, which ones form? And sort, of rep and sort of see in the, my greenhouse setting exactly what happens when any of the landowners or local public plants one of these cuttings. The second one is to do very similar, but to match the climate scenarios in the UK. So to see whether the mycorrhizae have a, a role in mitigating some of these water stress issues, nutrient access issues, that we know will be a problem, particularly in the south. And also to see whether the different clones, um, whether there's any plasticity in them and how they respond as well. So it's not just with the black poplar as a whole, but actually individual clones. Are there any good ones, bad ones? Can we try and breed more? And lastly, it's to sort of come up with some management ideas. So if it comes out that mycorrhizae are important, they probably are, but to what extent? Then it's talking to landowners and local people to actually make an effort to, to encourage that soil. So if trees die because there's no mycorrhizal network, because it's just not there, which is quite likely, then we need to find ways to help that happen. And if it requires actually people to actively prune, remove dead leaves to stop disease transfer, then again, that's something we should consider asking about. So I'll end my talk there. I'll be very happy to take questions. Um, and a big thanks to my supervisors and also to Fran and the Sussex Wildlife Trust for putting up with me and to many landowners. <laughs>